Hey, hey, good morning. My name is Troy, I'm one of the pastors here. I am honored that you are with us today as we kick off a brand new series, Apocalypse. It's gonna be a fun series talking about the book of Revelation. Throughout history and well, really even before human history, angels, people have wanted to be the man, the supreme commander, the ruler of all. Like it started with Satan, he said, I want to make my throne like God's throne and can't make yourself like God, you're a created being. So God kicked him out of heaven and along with one third of the angels who sided with him, they became demons, they roamed the earth, they torment us. Um, but, but since he's been come to earth, has come to earth, he and his minions are, inspire a host of men through the years or have inspired a host of men to try their hand at world dominion. I mean, the list is so long, it's unbelievable. Men who wanted to be rulers of all, some who wanted to be worshiped. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Alexander the Great, Muhammad, Attila the Hun, Hitler, Stalin, Loki and Thanos. I mean, it just, it goes on and on. All these people who want others to bow down to them. They, they want all this. And even the guy we're gonna talk about next week, the worst of all, the Antichrist, um, you know, will want people to bow before him and the dragon, Satan himself. But all of these folks have one thing in common. They have all or will all fail because only one has the power, the authority, the dominion, the ability to rule all, to rule the universe and to rule the earth. And his name is Jesus Christ. And the book of Revelation is his story of taking back what is rightfully his. Because he's our creator, he's our judge, he's our redeemer, only he can rule all. Only he can do what we're gonna read about in the book of Revelations. We're calling this series, The Apocalypse, which is a really cool word, uh, apocalypse, like saying that. Can you say that with me, apocalypse? Yes, it's a cool word that means, well, if you Google it, this is what it means. The complete final destruction of the world as described in the book of Revelation. It's the destruction of this world. There's a lot more to it than that. But that's what we're gonna be talking about the next three weeks. So glad you're here today as we kick it off because we're gonna be digging into the book of Revelations. Now, Revelations 22 chapters, I've got three weeks to do it. So we're not gonna get in the weeds. Some of you are gonna want me to get in the weeds. Hey, Troy, what about those locusts with scorpion tails? That sounds bad to the bone. I can't get in the weeds, I'd love to. We'll talk about the Great Tribulation next week, but I'm gonna give you like the 30,000 foot view. And here, here's why. Because Revelations, I mean, honestly, we could spend the rest of the year talking about it. There's so much there. But I'm gonna give you some tools, some overall knowledge so that when you read the book for yourself, you're gonna enjoy it a lot more. It's one of the things I love about Generations Church. You have such a hunger to know God's word. And so I'm just trying to give you tools to, to get to know God and get to know his word better. And so you'll get that over the next few weeks, kind of give it an overall understanding. So we'll take three weeks to do it. Now, here's our plan, just so you'll kind of know where we're going. Today, we're gonna to cover chapters one through five. And if I'm being honest with you, we're gonna skip about three of those chapters. Uh, we're gonna cover mainly chapter one and chapter five. I'll give you an overview of the others. And then uh, next week, Jesus is the righteous judge. We'll cover chapter six through 18 of Revelations, which basically is covering the great tribulation. It's a seven year period. And we'll tell you, and it's a fascinating seven year period. And we'll talk about that. And then the final week, Jesus is the king of kings. We'll cover the final chapters of Revelations where we'll talk about heaven, hell, judgment. What's the eternal state look like in heaven? How do you get there? All those kind of things. We'll do that in the last week. And so it's gonna be fun. Now, before we read the very first verse, oh, by the way, you notice all these have something in common? It's that word right there. It is Jesus. He is, this is his revealing. This is what Revelations is. Now, before we, we read the first verse, let me kind of set the table for you. A good meal deserves fine linen tablecloth and some flatware and some, uh, a cloth napkin to put in your lap. So let me set the table. 
kind of tell you, because if you've never read the book of Revelations or no, don't know anything about eschatology, end times, you're like, whoa, I don't even understand. Where, where did it all come from? Let me kind of set it up for you. The letter, the book of Revelations is a vision that God gave John. He was awake, but had the vision. And John, now the apostle John was the last of the 12 disciples of Jesus. He's the last one that's alive. All the others have been martyred. All the others have gone to be with the Lord. The year is 95 AD. So the first century is about to end. Think of it this way. The resurrection of Jesus Christ had happened 62 years before this. John's just been serving the Lord faithfully for the last 60 plus years, just doing what God's called him to do, preaching the gospel. The emperor, the Roman emperor at this point is Emperor Domitian. He ruled the Roman empire from 81 to 96 AD. He was a ruthless dictator. And he was one of those who was self-proclaimed Lord and God. And the apostle John said, I've met the Lord and God. He's Jesus Christ, he's not you. And, and Domitian of course didn't like that. So he exiled him to the island of Patmos. Patmos is a little island in the Mediterranean Sea off the uh, coast of Greece. I'll give you a little close up here. So you can see it's just a small island there. I haven't been there, it's on the bucket list. Would love to go sometime, but I'm told that you can go to the island of Patmos and you can actually walk into a cave where we believe the apostle John lived while he was exiled there and, and you know, wrote the book of Revelation when he received this vision from God. So, so that's where it all happened, 95 AD. And after he finished the book of Revelation, the canon of the scripture was closed. There are no more books that will ever be added to the Bible. That's it. So here we go. Revelations chapter one, verse one. This is a revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the events that must soon take place. He sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant, John, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is his report of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, revelation, you notice it's singular. Sometimes we go, it's revelations. No, it's just one. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ, but it's, it's a revealing, that's what the word means. It's a revealing of the glory, the dominion, the power, and the judgment, the future judgment of Jesus Christ. And here's what I love about it. It is the future. Like people are always prognosticating about the future. Want to, want, want to know what the stock market's gonna do. Want to know what the world, who's gonna win this. We get a glimpse of what's gonna happen tomorrow. Yes, it's hard to understand. I don't understand everything about Revelation you want when you read it, but that's okay. The parts we do understand, have this understanding about it. This is gonna happen tomorrow, or not You know, like tomorrow. We don't know the dates when it all is gonna happen, but you know what I'm talking about, in the future. And don't miss this from verse one. Um, this is a revelation from Jesus Christ. He's the one who gives it. He's revealing himself. John's the scribe, but Jesus is the author. Now, you can read about Jesus' first coming and the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But he came then as a sacrificial servant. He came to die for the sins of the world. Spoiler alert, in the book of Revelation, he will not be a sacrificial servant. He will be the conquering king. He will come and he will take over and he will take back what is rightfully his. And you'll see that in the book. Now, um, this is really cool. I'm so glad you're here today. Cause you, you know what? Don't we all wanna get a blessing? You get a blessing just for hanging out here, just for watching online. Look at this, verse three, God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church and he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says for the time is near. We're in the church age. We're in the last period of history before the great tribulation, before the second return of Jesus Christ. And God's promise to us because we're reading about the future, we get a blessing. And we get a blessing, man, listen, it's something I used to tell my kids growing up. When we obey God, O obedience leads to blessing, disobedience leads to consequences. Some of you know what I'm talking about. When you disobey the word of God, there's always something, there's a consequence for that. But there's blessing for those who listen to his message and obey it. Here's what's gonna happen. As you listen to this message today and over the next couple of weeks, 
It's gonna change the way you live if you'll allow it to. If you'll listen and be a, a doer of the word and not just a hearer only. Okay, here we go. Verse seven. Again, I'm skipping because we're getting the 30,000 foot view. Look, he comes with the clouds of heaven and everyone will see him. Even those who pierced him and all the nations of the world were mourned for him. Yes, amen. And so he's, just, he's announcing it. In case I haven't announced it loud and clear to you yet, Jesus Christ is coming back to this planet. Jesus Christ is coming back. And, and those who pierced him, can you imagine being one of those who live in the first century who pierced Jesus Christ? There'll be a collective, oh no, from them. And, and many will mourn. See, I think there'll be two kinds of folks on the earth when Jesus comes back. Those who will mourn and those who go, thank God he's here. Who've been longing for his coming, who will take it with great joy. I wanna be the latter. I wanna be like, okay, if, if I'm on the earth, when Jesus Christ comes back, I wanna be rejoicing when he comes. Now, just to reiterate, because some of you might've drifted from me a little bit, I'm gonna bring you back in. Jesus Christ is coming back to this planet. He's gonna return and no one will miss his coming. Like everyone will see him. Everybody, you go, well, well Troy, what if I'm asleep in the Arctic Circle in a snow cave? Don't worry, you'll, you'll be awakened. First Thessalonians 4 says, he'll come, when he comes, he'll come with a loud command, the voice of a mighty angel and the trumpet call of God. That sounds really loud. And, and it will, not only will it be loud, everyone will see him with their eyes. Even the blind will see him with their eyes. At that moment when he comes back and he, and he, and he returns for us, about a billion questions, unanswered questions, will be answered. And about a billion, I wonder if God cares. All of a sudden we'll know he does. All those who wondered, are we alone in the universe? Won't have to wonder anymore. And all those who decided to place their faith in something other than the Bible, I could be talking to you right now. Something other than Jesus Christ will let out a collective, oh no. And those of us who are Christ's followers, who believe the word of God and who believe that Jesus Christ is the creator and the judge and the Lord of all. Even though some things in this life have not made sense, some prayers didn't get answered, and we don't understand why God allows certain evil things in the world and not every, we have our doubts too, but we placed our faith in Jesus Christ and in this moment, we'll let out a collective, oh, thank God, it's all true. And in that moment, everyone, everyone will finally, finally realize that Jesus Christ is Lord. Summer Olympics started in Paris a few days ago. I'm sure many of you watched some of the opening ceremony or some of the Olympic games. I'll probably watch some this afternoon, go USA. But uh, the most watched event in human history actually occurred two years ago. 4.1 billion people watched the funeral of Queen Elizabeth. There's eight billion people on the planet. So that's a lot of like half the earth watched that funeral. Now scholars have estimated that in human history, and again, this is an estimate, we don't know for sure, that 100 billion people have lived on this planet. 100 billion people in human history. So let's just go with that estimate. In this moment when Jesus Christ returns, all 100 billion people will know that Jesus Christ is Lord. Their eyes will be opened and they will see. Now, that doesn't mean everybody's gonna worship him and follow him. Some will still remain in rebellion against him, but every knee will bow. So here's my advice to you, don't wait. Get ready for the coming of Jesus Christ because just like it was prophesied that he would come the first time, and he fulfilled all those prophecies to a T. There's way more prophecies about his second coming. So he's coming back. Verse nine, I, John, am your brother and your partner in suffering and in God's kingdom and in the patient endurance to which Jesus calls us. I was exiled to the island of Patmos. Again, he's giving us his little introduction here to the exile uh, the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus. It was the Lord's day, so it was a Sunday. And I was worshiping in the spirit and suddenly I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast. 
We'll see this in the book of Revelations. People talk really loud here, like Jesus and the angels, like they will get your attention. <laughs> Here's what he already said, write in a book everything you see. And this is the book of Revelations. He wrote it down for us. And send it to the seven churches in the cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, it's a fun word, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So again, what he does at the beginning of this, this, this was a letter to, to seven churches, literal seven churches in Asia Minor. These were the names of the towns and the churches. And so this letter went to them for, to preserve it, to spread it throughout all the world to the churches. And we won't read chapters two and three, but you can read them. I mean, we could take a, a Sunday or a weekend on every one of those churches. They're amazing letters of encouragement, of rebuke, all those kind of things. And some people have speculated because it's in the book of Revelations, they've said these letters are actually periods of history. So in other words, like the, the church of Laodicea, Jesus told them, don't be lukewarm. And some have said, well, see, that's the period of the 21st, 20th and 21st century, the church in North America and Western Europe, because we're kind of lukewarm, maybe. That's an interpretation. I don't know. We're not going to take all the time to, to understand that, but th I want to understand these are literal letters. Now, at this point, John's given his introduction, and then he hears this voice behind him like, you know, mighty waters, he turns around. And this is really kind of where the book begins. When I turned to see he was speaking to me, he's in his vision, he sees someone. I saw seven golden lampstands. And standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. The Son of Man was Jesus' favorite title for himself when he was on earth. He's the Son of God, he's God the Son, but he's also born of man, Son of Man. Son of man. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like flames of fire. Just picture this in your mind. His feet were like polished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth. And his face was like the sun in all its brilliance. Now, you're gonna see this word a lot in the book of Revelations as you read it, the word like, because John is seen with human eyes, objects and visions that no human has ever seen. Now, some have speculated, well, part of what he's seeing, like when we talk next week about the Great Tribulation, and he talks about all these strange creatures, is John seeing an F-16 pilot or an F-16 airplane? Is he seeing drones that shoot missiles? Is he seeing things that are gonna happen 200 years from now maybe that we don't even know about, we haven't even seen? Possibly, that could be what John's seeing. But it, clearly he's seeing Jesus Christ in a way he never has before. He's seeing Jesus in this, in this passage in all his glory. Now, one of the challenges we have as we read the book of Revelation is kind of going, okay, which part is literal and which part is symbolism? Because there's both throughout the book and you'll see this. So if I'm interpreting this passage, just give you an example, I believe there's both here. I believe that one day when we see Jesus Christ in all his glory, his face will, will shine like the sun because he is glorious and he is powerful and he created the sun and he's more powerful than the sun. <coughs> Excuse me. But... I don't think there's a metal object protruding from his mouth. I think that's symbolism. That would be kind of freaky looking. But, but here's what it's a symbol of. The Bible tells us that the word of God is like a sharp two-edged sword. It cuts us going in, it cuts us going out, it encourages us, it rebukes us, it refines us. If you've ever read the Bible, you've experienced that. That's the power of God's word. Jesus speaks the power of God's word, comes out of his mouth. We'll, we'll read in week three about Jesus speaking the word of God, this sharp double-edged sword destroying the forces of Satan with just the words of his mouth. So is it a laser beam? Is it fire? I don't know what it is, but clearly it's powerful. And here, this is interesting, okay? John, when he sees him, he, I, fell, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. Now, I think that's interesting because you think about John, he walked around with Jesus on the planet, like eight meals with him. They were buddies, they were friends. And now he sees him and he's like, he's out. 
like, what's going on? It's because Jesus is so glorious in his glorious form. He's like, I've never seen him like this. But he laid his right hand on me, Jesus did, and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. Your Bible might have alpha and omega, first and last letters of the Greek uh, alphabet. He's the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and the grave. I love that. Jesus is basically saying, look, if you wanna escape hell, if you wanna escape death, I hold the keys to it. He's telling John, this is who I am. And, and, and uh, it's interesting because, well, let me, let me back up, because this whole description of Jesus is like, it, again, revelation is all about him. It's all about Jesus Christ. It's Jesus is revealing a new uh, way for us to see him, and, and it's cool. Now, at this point, I know you're gonna kill me, but I'm gonna skip all the way to chapter five because as I mentioned, um, you know, we're just, there's, there's so much ground to cover, but I hope you'll read chapters two and three, which is the seven churches. And then chapter four, like when I wrote this sermon, it was like an hour long. So I had to cut some parts out. And I had to cut out my teaching on Revelations 4, which is so good. But I made myself a note. I want to come back later in the year, or next year. I want to just do a, a whole s sermon on just Revelations 4, because I'm just going to tell you about it. What happens at this point is the setting changes. And John seeing Jesus, his vision of him on the Isle of Patmos, but all of a sudden he's taken up into heaven. And in Revelations 4, he gets a vision of God the Father who's seated on his throne. He's surrounded by living creatures. We can't even understand what they look like. He's surrounded by 24 elders and they're worshiping God. Holy, holy, holy. It's an amazing scene. But God is holding something in his hand and we have to get to Revelations 5 because I want you to see what that is because that sets up everything for next week and it sets up really the book of Revelations, okay? Then I saw a scroll and the right hand of the one who was seated, seated on the throne, sitting on the throne, that's God the Father, he's sitting on the throne. There was writing on the inside, uh, yeah, scroll. So on this scroll, there was writing on the inside and the outside of the scroll, and it was sealed with seven seals. So I have a little homemade scroll here, and Lisa was kind enough to melt some wax rings on there so you can kind of see what, what it would look like. And back then in you know, Hebrew culture, a scroll would be like, papyra, which was, you know, reeds, or it'd be parchment, which was animal skin, like leather, and they would write on it. And so it was very common for some kind of title deed or a marriage license or some kind of official document to be written on a scroll, and they would write all the text on the inside, they would sign it, and then they would stamp it with a seal and melt that wax on there so that the only person who can open the seal is the person who has the authority to do it, okay? In other words, the one who bought the property or the one who's married or whatever, it's sealed that way. For a, you've probably seen that in movies where you know, a king would seal something. Well, this is interesting because this particular scroll is different. Uh, and John MacArthur in his commentary had a, a great description of it. He said, the scroll John saw in God's hand is the title deed to the earth, official document which he will give to Christ. We'll see that in a moment. Unlike other such deeds, however, it does not record the descriptive details of what Christ will inherit, like an inheritance or like a, a deed of property that you might buy. But instead, but rather, how he will regain his rightful inheritance. So we'll see that next week as Jesus begins to pop the seals and, and, and open the seals judgment will come and it will show us how Jesus will take back what is rightfully his. And it's going to be fun. It's going to be fascinating. So you don't want to miss it and, and all that. So here's what's happening. So God's sitting on his throne in heaven and he's holding this scroll and everybody wants to know what's inside. What's it? What's the document say? Verse two. And I saw a strong angel who shouted with a loud, loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals on this scroll and open it? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and read it. So this scroll 
It's in the hands of the Lord God Almighty, God the Father. Light itself flees from God's presence. And God's holding in his hand. Who has the courage, who is worthy to walk up to, to God Almighty, take the scroll out of his hand and begin to pop the seals? Silence. Because no one was found worthy in all of heaven. We're gonna see this scene in heaven. It's gonna be amazing. Then John, I began to weep bitterly because John wanted to see it open so bad because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and read it. But one of the 24 elders said to me, stop weeping. Look, the line of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne has won the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll and it's seven seals. Now, let me, let me just explain some of this. It's so good. Who's he describing? He's describing our Lord Jesus Christ, who's the only one in the universe who's worthy to open the scroll. Why? Because he's the line of the tribe of Judah. This is a prophecy about the Messiah that was made way back in Genesis chapter 49. This is when Jacob prophesied over the, you know, the 12 tribes of Israel, they came from Jacob, they came from his 12 sons. And when he was blessing them, he was prophesying over them and he laid his hand on Judah, one of his sons, and he said, from you will come a line, one who will conquer, one who will be the Messiah, will come from your tribe, Judah. And, and of course, that's Jesus Christ. Now, the Jews in the first century missed it because they were looking for a lion who would come and conquer the Roman Empire. They weren't looking for a sacrificial lamb who would come first. But here's the thing about the lion you have to understand. No one tells the lion when to hunt. No one tells the lion when to clamp his jaws upon his prey. Only the lion chooses that. And the lion will choose this in the book of Revelation. The lion, Jesus Christ, will become the lion of Judah when he chooses to be at the end times. He's also heir to David's throne. God gave King David a promise. A descendant will always sit on your throne will always sit on the throne who will rule forever and ever. And in Luke 1 and in Matthew, uh, or I'm sorry, Matthew 1 and Luke 3, uh, we see that Jesus was a descendant of David from his father's line, Joseph, and also from his mother's line, Mary. He was the fulfillment of the prophecy of old. It's so cool how the Bible comes together. There's prophecy and this is future and it all comes together in Jesus Christ. The Bible from Genesis to Revelation is all about Jesus. And then Jesus' appearance gets even stranger because we've seen him in all his glory, right? Then I saw a lamb that looked as if it had been slaughtered, but it was now standing between the throne and the four living beings and among the 24 elders. So no one was worthy. And all of a sudden this lamb, this slaughtered lamb shows up in their midst. He's the one who's worthy. He's the one who stepped forward to, to take this scroll. And, and now, let me kind of explain this. Well, let me read the rest of verse six. This lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which represent the sevenfold spirit of God that is sent out into every part of the earth. You're totally confused now, aren't you? I know, it's crazy. Like, why, why did his appearance change so much? And why is he, you know, in John, I mean, Revelations one, he was glorious and eyes like fire, and now he's a slaughtered lamb. Well, the, in the Bible, horns represent, a lot of symbolism here, horns represent power. Seven is the perfect number. You'll see seven in the Bible, it means perfection. It's a number of completion. So what he's saying, and John kind of gives us a little bit of understanding about it, they represent the seven, they represent the spirit of God. He's just saying Jesus is the lamb of God, but in all his power, nothing is hidden from him. He sees all righteousness. He sees all wickedness. Things we think we can hide, a good deed we think no one will see. He sees it all because he's all powerful. And, but the lamb thing, I know it throws me off because I'm, I'm picturing this in my imagination. What's interesting because what you see in the book of Revelation, this is, this is God's favorite title for his son in the book of Revelation. Jesus, the Messiah is only mentioned as a lamb of God once in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, 
four times in the New Testament other than Revelation. But in the book of Revelation, he's mentioned as the Lamb of God 31 different times. It's like God saying to us, all the glory of heaven that you're reading about, all the judgment of the great tribulation, everything in the future, all that, it's all made possible because the Lamb of God was slain before the foundations of the earth, because the Lamb of God laid down his life for me and for you, because he was a sacrifice for us. You still with me? All right, here we go, verse seven. The Lamb stepped forward and he took the scroll from the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. And you're gonna kill me, but I'm stopping right there. <laughs> you gotta come back next week and to see what happens when he opens the seals, it's bad to the bone. He will take back what is rightfully his. Now, before I let you go, I wanna nail down one big idea because if you don't get this, I haven't done a good job of really explaining what this is all about. Here's the big idea. Jesus Christ is not a nice teacher among other world religions. He's not a sacrificial prophet who came to give you a good example to follow. Heaven, salvation, it's not a multiple choice test where Jesus is A and Buddha is B and you being a real good person and living a good life is C. No, there's no other choices on the exam. There is Jesus because he is creator, he is Lord, he is judge, he's everything or there's nothing at all. Like if we wanna see God, if we wanna know God, if we wanna have heaven, it's all about Jesus. It's all about him. Just in case you forgot anything I already told you, I'll go back and we'll just review some of the titles. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. First letter and last letter of the Greek alphabet. He is the one. It started with him, ended with him. Some of you thought, well, he was, wasn't he born in Bethlehem? <laughs> no, he became a human being, the incarnation. He became a human being in Bethlehem. He's always been, he's our creator. He always will be. It's an arrow in both directions. He, is, he has the keys to death and the grave. I love this. Like we wanna avoid hell, spiritual death. There's only one, it's Jesus. He has the keys. I'm gonna place the full weight of my faith and my trust in him. You've seen a janitor with the keys hanging from his belt. Jesus got, has the keys to death and the grave hanging from the belt. He's the one that lets us into heaven. He's the line of the tribe of Judah. I've talked about that already. He is the conquering king. He's the one who takes over. Uh, no one can stand against him. He's heir to David's throne. He's the fulfillment of the prophecy that there will always be a king on the throne. He will be the king of kings forever and ever and ever. And he is the lamb of God. Again, God's favorite title for Jesus in the book of Revelations because he takes away the sins of the world. I talk about the cross a lot. I talk about the blood of Jesus because, you know, I'm a Christian preacher and that's what we do. And, and maybe you, you talk about it a lot. Maybe you think about it some, but I think sometimes we talk about the cross and the blood of Christ so much that it, at times we're guilty of it becoming commonplace. Like, oh yeah, he died on the cross for my sins. But in my more reflective moments, when I'm thinking about who he is, that he is God, that he is creator, that he is judge of all, that all salvation depends on him and what he did for me. And when I think about God, becoming a human being like me and walking on this earth and, and, and dying on a cross for my sins and for your sins. I don't know if you ever think about that, but when you think about the love that he has for me and for you, that he would do that, in those moments when I really think about it, here's what it does for me. I just worship. I just, I go, I wanna serve him. I wanna go, Lord, whatever I have, I wanna give to you. Like, I don't wanna be halfway in, Lord. When you come back for me, I don't want there to be any shame at your coming. I want you to know that I'm all in for your kingdom, Lord. It's not about me, it's about your kingdom. 
And if I have any challenge for you today, that is the challenge to stop living halfway for God. Stop living halfway for Jesus Christ. Some of you walked in today with a load in, of guilt and sin, and you're bearing all this weight of sin because you haven't surrendered that sin to Jesus. Some of you walked in today with, with these dreams for your life, and I know God wants us to have dreams, but maybe some of your dreams are selfish and you've never asked God, God, what's your purpose for my life? Why did you put me on this planet? Because I believe God wants to use you to change your world. But it starts with surrendering to Him. Someone ask you to do something today we don't do very often in generations, but it's something someone led me in many years ago at a youth camp. It was life-changing for me. In just a moment, I'm gonna ask you if you're willing to give your life to Jesus Christ for the very first time, or you're willing to rededicate your life to him. I'm gonna ask you in just a moment to lift your hand up. Now, here's what we're not gonna do. I'm not gonna say, everybody bow your heads, close your eyes, nobody's looking, slip your hand up. I think that creates cowards. Because if you can't raise your hand with everybody looking in a Christian church where everybody loves you and everybody loves Jesus, when you get outside this building, you're sure not gonna live for him. We're not creating cowards today, we're creating disciples, okay? So everybody's gonna be looking. And I'm also not gonna ask you to raise your hand if you love Jesus. Like maybe you're walking with him today and you love him and you're, everything's good with you and God. That's awesome, keep your hand down. This is for those of you who have said, I'm, I'm committing my life to Christ for the very first time. Or you'd say, I, I know I'm a Christian, but I've had one foot in the world and I'm, and I'm living for sin instead of living for Jesus. And I know Jesus is coming back for me. I know he's coming back and I wanna be all in for him. I wanna live for him. So if that's you, if you're ready to be all in with Jesus right now, would you just slip your hand up and say, Troy, I'm giving my life to Jesus. I'm all, I'm rededicating my life to him. Thank you all over the room. Thank you for your courage. Everybody's looking and you're raising your hand. Thank you for that. I wanna ask you to do something for me. Everybody here, if you'll bow your heads and close your eyes. I just wanna to talk to you if you raised your hand. Now, if you didn't raise your hand, you know Jesus, pray for those around you. If you know someone who raised their hand, pray for them right now. And God would have this way in their heart. But here's what I wanna ask you. If you've never trusted Christ, I want you to pray this prayer to God. I want you to say, Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. It separated me from you. But I believe, Jesus, that you died on the cross for me and I believe that you rose from the dead and I believe you're coming back. So I'm committing my life to you, Jesus. Come in and save me. Say that to, in your own words. I'm not gonna lead you. you. You say that to the Lord when you're ready. And then for those of you who are Christ followers, but you haven't been living for him and you're saying today I'm rededicating my life, I'm recommitting to Jesus. Then say that to him. Say, Lord, I'm sorry for doing it my way. My way's not working. And Lord, I wanna do it your way. And I'm all in for you, Jesus. You're my Lord and you're my savior. I wanna live for you from this day forward. Just say that to the Lord. Father, I wanna pray for my friends who are here today who were courageous enough to raise their hand. And God, I pray that you fill them with your spirit like you filled me. God, that you give them the power to live for you from this day forward, God, they would seek you in your word. They would uh, pray to you. They would get involved in the body of Christ. They would serve you with their gifts. And God, they would stop keeping score. They would stop holding back. And God, they would surrender their heart completely to you. God, give them the faith and the courage to do that. Some of them are coming from very difficult circumstances, workplaces, homes, Jesus, where you're not exalted, where they're gonna be mocked. So God, give them courage to live for you. Use them to make a difference, Father. Help them to be all in. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you look up here real quick, 
So those of you who raised your hand, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but Satan and his demons saw that and they're coming after you this week, okay? That's what happens when you say, I'm gonna live for Jesus. So I'm gonna show you how to get off the roller coaster because some of you have been on the roller coaster and how to have a steady walk with Christ. Get a copy of the Bible and begin to read it every day. Talk to the Lord in his word. Surround yourself with brothers and sisters in Christ who love him or go in the same direction as you and get involved in the body of Christ. It'll make all the difference in the world.